nurses at Kenyatta National Hospital, the country's largest referral hospital, down their tools in salary protest. President Uhuru Kenyatta set to launch Lamu Port in October. Kenya marks International Literacy Day with Cabinet Secretary Professor George Magoha calling for proper guidelines to ensure quality education. And in sports, the victorious national Tong Il Mudo team jets back into the country. A good evening and welcome to Breaking Today. I'm Lenny Rashid. Our sign language interpreter tonight is Tracy Dorcas. Services at the top referral hospital in the region, Kenyatta National Hospital, were interrupted for the better part of Monday as workers downed their tools to protest delayed fund disbursements enacted by resolutions from the State Corporation Advisory Committee passed in 2012. Following deliberations with their employer, however, the workers agreed on a return to work formula that should be be implemented in the next two weeks. The resolution from the State Cooperative Advisory Committee in 2012 upgraded the hospital parastatal status from 3C to 7A. This means changes in remuneration were to be reflected in the workers' basic salaries, house allowance as well as leave allowance. This, however, has not been implemented so far, occasioning the stalemate. To avert the crisis, the government was swift to act and held a consultative meeting today with various stakeholders to try and get an immediate solution. Lakini our commitment, we will implement the structure. Kama tumefanya ya KMTC, ni ya kengale chatushinda? Kwa tutaifanya, iyo ndiyo tunawakikishia. Kwa hivyo nimefurai kwamba, nimewapa tu, wiki mbili peke yake at most. Na hata wakiweza wakuje karibu zaidi, watuambie. Kenya International Hospital Board Chairman Engineer Nicholas Gumbe also reassured the striking staff that all their issues will be settled once they get more correct figures of what should be paid. He committed himself to ensuring that the agreement comes to fruition. I'm happy to report to you we have met today and there is white smoke. Yeah. <laughs> we must get the correct figures so that when we come to you kindly, we are talking on a matter that your union has agreed on the Board of Management of the Hospital has agreed on, Ministry of Health has agreed on, Ministry of the Treasury has agreed on, SCAC has agreed on, Salary and Remuneration Commission has agreed on. Because, you know, that's the constitution we gave ourselves. Pius Chaboy, Kenya International Hospital Chairman, was of the opinion that though they have waited for too long for implementation of the CBA, there is a light at the end of the tunnel with the agreement to be fulfilled in the next two weeks. I am impressed to inform you today that... The Board of Management of Kenyatta National Hospital, in conjunction with the, the Principal Secretary, Minister of Health, Principal Secretary, Secretary Minister of uh, Treasury, and, uh, there is, uh, and the one from the uh, State Cooperation Advisory Advis Advis Committee, Committee, together with the union, we had a, a lengthy meeting which has taken us up to this time. And uh, I am happy to report to you that. We have reached an agreement. We have agreed that we are suspending our strike for the next two weeks. And by 20th end, we shall be telling you the next course of action. Thank you very much. Be brave. Solidarity together. As much as the strike involved all the workers at the hospital, it also emerged that most of the nurses did not take part since they are under a different union known as the Kenya National Union of Nurses. A spot check at the hospital by our team revealed that some nurses and doctors, including radiographers, were on duty and serving patients. An official memo in our position showing tactics that the management was trying to use to stop workers from going on strike but failed shows how the management promises to pay house allowance arrears together with the September salary. The workers agreed to go back to work as they wait for implementation in two weeks, as promised by the government and the management. Sally Limo, Switch TV. President Uhuru Kenyatta has announced that the first berth of the new Lamu port will be opened in October. The president, who expressed satisfaction with the progress of the ongoing construction works at the seaport, said the mega project will create the much-needed jobs for the Kenyan youth. The president further announced that plans are underway to start the construction of a crude oil pipeline from the Turkana oil fields to the new port. He urged workers to remain vigilant and to continue working closely with security agencies in averting threats from would-be terrorists.
Hivi karibuni mwezi ujao tutakuwa hapa tukifungua kirasmi hii baadhi ya kwanza ambaye naambiwa mtakuwa mmemaliza na tutaifungua tukiona meli ikija hapa ikishukisha mizi mizigo in rather sad news, three people have died and scores of other injured following a midway accident involving a Nissan Matatu and a van along Nairobi Nakuru Highway. Two of the passengers died on the spot, while the third died while undergoing treatment following the accident near Delamere Farm in Naivasha. Fifteen people were admitted in Naivasha Sub County Hospital, while six of them are in critical condition with plans to refer them to Rift Valley for specialized treatment. The accident occurred after the Matatu that was heading from Nakuru from Naivasha tried to overtake a fleet of cars ramming head-on to an oncoming private minibus that was carrying a group of students. The accident caused a major traffic snarl-up as police and members of the public moved in to rescue passengers trapped in the wreck. Despite the introduction of the free universal primary school in 2002, only an estimated 44% of Kenyans have primary school education and below, meaning that around 2.4 million Kenyans have no formal education according to a 2019 Ipsos survey. To this end, Education Cabinet Secretary Professor George Magoha has taken a tough stand on officials in his ministry urging all stakeholders to ensure that proper guidelines are followed to the letter for a quality and more inclusive education system to be achieved more so among the marginalized and minority communities. West Pokot County has more than 10,000 adult learners across 277 learning centers, making it the leading county with adult learners. To this end, the county was fronted to host this year's National Literacy Day at Makutano Stadium. The county was chosen because of the high number of learners attending adult classes. Education Cabinet Secretary Professor George Magoha said that the government is in process of facilitating the gazettement of the National Steering Committee on Development, Use and Preservation of Indigenous Language, Kenyan Sign Languages, Braille and other communication forms with the initiative expected to ensure development of alphabetic writing among marginalized and minority speech communities to enhance inclusivity. I wish to send a very stern warning to all stakeholders to be vigilant and to stop engaging in destroying our children. The CS noted that under the competency-based curriculum, the Ministry of Education is encouraging learning at lower grades to be conducted in indigenous languages for faster and easier understanding and as a way of preserving the languages. Just think of yourself as a teacher. Why do you want to cheat the child? Because my colleagues, I still recall that my primary school teacher, who taught me how to multiply, is still alive. So when I go, I go to him. What if he had sneaked and his hand was to him? I would look at him as a What's that? West Pokot Governor Professor John Lonyangapuo said despite his government footing in measures to support the adult education in the county, there's a huge shortage of teachers for both primary and secondary schools and such, there was an urgent need to deploy more staff to the county owing to an increase in the number of students joining schools. <laughs> The whole country has a student, but anyways, for God, you're the biggest student. And because the new appetite you have, the student may die up, kill a boot on another form of your view. It's ideal. West Pokot County is one among few others in the country that has introduced free adult education in the last two years, something that has seen thousands now able to attend school. The governor who prides himself in the North Rift to have successfully managed to operationalize the adult mode of education, so he awarded a trophy for being county in support of adult education. Dana Rose, Switch TV. High pesticides residues in flowers is emerging as a major drawback for Kenyan farmers hoping to continue exporting the commodity to international markets. This comes even as the sector continues to account for about 40% of the all horticultural exports being Kenya, being the largest supplier of cut flowers to the European Union and one of the most prominent fresh flower exporting countries in Africa. Give us on minor reports. 
Kenya flowers exporters will have to comply with the biosafety rules set by Australia to enable them to continue the trade with the country. The strict regulations are meant to ensure the flowers are fumigated and have zero pest attacks, contrary to earlier reports that Australia had banned flowers export from Kenya. I saw recently in the media uh, there were stories that there is a, a ban uh, on export of cut flowers from Kenya to Australia. I want to correct that. That is not a ban. The thing is that Australia has just come up with new regulations or new rules that are telling us simply that your level of non-compliance when it comes to pests is high. Do everything you can to reduce it. And it's not just us, it's to all countries. So this communique was sent to Colombia, was sent to Ecuador, was sent to Ethiopia, was sent to many other uh, countries that produce cut flowers. The European Union is Kenya's biggest market, consuming 66% of the flowers. However, it remains unclear of what could transpire if Brexit becomes a reality. Whether the event will shake flowers export from Kenya, it remains to be seen. Europe accounts almost 80% of our market. With, uh, we are having challenges with Brexit. We are very keen to know how Brexit is uh, going to impact on our, our business. And uh, we are talking to government institutions and uh, ministries. Uh, we are also talking to our foreign missions in Europe but also to the buyers uh, in those countries to make sure that we are well cushioned even when Brexit becomes a reality. The flower industry in Kenya has continued to blossom, according to the Flower Council, and is now almost hitting 100 billion shillings in value, thanks to rising international demands for the Kenyan flower as new markets continue to emerge. The sector employs over 100,000 people who directly work in flower farms and culminates to over 2 million Kenyans benefiting from the sector. We are happy that we've been growing over the years, um, starting as a small industry back in the 1980s, and now we are a multi-billion uh, industry. Last year, we managed to rake in a whole 113 billion Kenya shillings. And uh, by extension, of course, we are the second a largest uh, commodity export from Kenya after tea. Kenya Flower Council Chief Executive Officer Clement Tulezi says the month of February that plus the host to the Valentine's Day has always been a test to the industry in terms of meeting the market demands of flowers, especially the red rose, which is associated with love. Give us a minor. Switch TV. We're taking a short break now. We'll be right back with lots more. Keep it switch. Don't touch that dial. Welcome back to Breaking Today. Welcome back to Breaking Today. Mama Lucy Hospital in Ambukasi, Nairobi is expected to benefit with a queue management system that will help the facility efficiently manage patient service delivery once they check in. This follows the signing of an agreement with UAP Old Mutual Group that will sponsor the queue management system. Hordes of patients wait to get treated at Mama Lucy Kibaki Hospital in Embakasi. Some have to stand with all the seats here filled by the hour. Although seemingly large from the outside, with roughly 1,000 persons serviced a day, the hospital feels small. This hospital is in the area where we have 70% of the Nairobians live, and they need all the necessary support that we can give them. And it's for this reason why we felt that it is important for us to partner with various organizations, various partners, to come and assist us. In a bid to optimize patient flow through a new queue management system, Old Mutual, in partnership with Mama Lucy Hospital, have signed a deal that will increase efficiency in record keeping and retrieval process as well as data collection. Ours is really to come and work as a partner with an organization like Mama Lucy and they look at where they have the greatest need. And indeed, going round, we found that this is one of the areas where a lot of uh, improvement is needed. We to put some of these things in order. Q system is one of the areas where people, they don't want to be seen like, they may not understand that uh, when, you're, you're, when you're queuing, your needs are different from the other person. 
And when you are called by a doctor, they will think that this person is so special, he has been actually jammed the queue. But with this system, you'll be able to go to where you are supposed to go, the right facility and the timing. Mama Lucy Hospital is the first public county referral hospital to have a queue management system. The new queue system is expected to equip the hospital in managing patients' waiting time, order in the queue, and type of treatment. When a patient comes in, he'll meet the vendor machine, pick a ticket number, for example, A013, and this number will be called to at various points, either at the triage center or at the consultation clinic or wherever he'll have chosen the service to be. This will end up having patients, more patients being seen, reducing the waiting time and the patient turnaround time. And with that, we'll have more Wananchi coming in because the confidence in the hospital will be built up. Along with the new system in place, the hospital waiting area will also receive a facelift thanks to the newfound partnership. Recording for Switch TV, this is Jolene King. Sudan's first cabinet since the ouster of President Omar al-Bashir has been sworn in as the African country transitions to civilian rule following nationwide protests that overthrew the autocrat. The 18-member cabinet led by Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok, which includes four women, took oath at the presidential palace in Khartoum. It's expected to steer the daily affairs of the country during a transition period of 39 months. The lineup was formed after Sudan last month swore in a sovereign Council, a joint civilian military ruling body that aims to oversee the transition. We have three years of work and efforts ahead of us. We reassure our people that we are determined to keep this great sacrifice by working to achieve these goals. The ambitions and hopes of Sudanese people that they dreamt of seem to be impossible in the past, but now they are possible through our joint efforts and work. Let's take a look at the money markets up next. Sibots. The national Tong Il Mudo team will be seeking to improve their performance when Kenya hosts the Mombasa Open International Tournament later this year. Kenya bagged nine medals in the recently concluded Jungju World Championships, two of the same medals from the ta total tally being gold. Following an outstanding performance in the second edition of the Jungju World Martial Arts Masterships in Korea, the national Tongilmudo team jetted back into the country on Monday morning. Kenya finished second behind the Philippines after bagging nine medals, two gold, two silver and two bronze. We <laughs> na pia tuliona challenges hata wale tulishindwa hatukushindwa na mbali sana ilikuwa unapata ni kama point moja ama mbili so tutajitayarisha hiyo ni hali ya michezo lazima kuwe na mshindi na aliyeshindwa Kenya participated in 12 different categories with Gordon Ocheng and Lona Apio winning gold in the men's and women's sparring categories respectively administration police officer Rosa Sheke and the open born basic team consisting of Collins Dunda Andrew Wanji and Samson Mambo won silver as Evans Odori, Elvis Malipe, Salma Ali, Patricia Mbago and Peter James Juguna walked away with bronze medals. Ilikuwa dhabu ya kwanza so nilisi vizuri. The thought haikukuwa rahisi because kila country ilikuwa inatoa their best players. So mimi personally nilishinda lakini niko challenged pia. So inani inani motivate inani encourage niendelee kutia bidii kwa sababu wale wengine pia wana train kila mtu anataka kupata hiyo gold 
tumeridhika na performance yetu this time sababu aim yetu ilikuwa ni kuperform better than it was perform last time so we are happy and uh, the graph inapanda vizuri hopefully next time we're going to be the champions the team was received by top ministry officials led by acting commissioner of sports Jackson Gitonga who emphasized on the government's commitment towards promoting the sport in the country kwa niaba ya serikali na kwa niaba yangu mimi mwenyewe serikali tumefurahia sana tumeona hiyo kuwekeza tuliwekeza kwa hawa vijana ni ya maana pesa ya serikali ya umma ijapotea na tumefurahia na zaidi ya wote tunafurahi kuona kwamba vijana wavulana wasichana wanashiriki kwa mchezo unajua kila tunataka kufanya ile inaitwa diversification tuingie michezo tofauti tofauti ndio vijana wetu waweza kupata riziki na pia waweza kupata nafasi ya kucheza na wenzao Afrika na hata dunia kote we admire the organizational structure of the Chunju World Martial Arts Mastership they have full support from the Korean government and the city of Chunju that is something which our country need to learn especially uh, the county government because uh, uh, for the last six years we've gotten considerable support from the uh, central government through the Ministry of Sports so I wish to um, uh, urge our counties to support major sports events because as you can see in, in, in Korea they had over 10,000 guests coming for this tournament so if you look at that in terms of income uh, as uh, tourists, it's a lot of money coming to the country. Focus will now shift to the seventh edition of the Mombasa Open International Championship that will be held in December. Abula Ahmed, Sush TV at the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport, Nairobi. Abula Ahmed with that report and the congratulations to the team. Gaspo women remained at the top of the Kenya Women Premier League standings after registering a 3-2 win over Kisumu All Starlets in a WPL match played at the Moy Stadium on the weekend. Gaspo women are now at the top of the log with 60 points, 5 points above second-placed Vihiga Queens. In other matches played this weekend, Thika Queens registered a 3-all draw with Osirian Ladies, while Zetec Sparks got a two-all draw with Eldoret Falcons. Spain moved closer to reaching Euro 2020 with a comfortable 4-0 qualifying win over the Faroe Islands in Group F. Roberto Moreno's side are top having won all six of their games under seven points clear of Sweden in second place. Valencia's Rodrigo scored twice for Spain, tapping home before curling a deflected effort in the second half with Paco Alcacer adding two late on Borussia Dortmund striker Alcacer poked in from close range on 89 minutes and headed in at the near post in injury time. Que bien se combinaron Thiago y Carvajal y Thiago viene con este centro y está el Cáceres el tercero. No. Centro remate, ahí está el Cáceres con el cuarto. Italy edged closer to qualifying for Euro 2020 as Jorginho penalty secured victory against Group J rivals Finland. Chelsea's midfielder Jorginho converted the winner after Incolo Barella's shot struck Saulo with a sentence hand in form Norwich striker Temu Puki had brought Finland level by scoring from the spot his seventh goal in six games in all competitions this season. Italy, who took the lead through Ciro Immobile's header, are nine points clear of third placed Armenia. That is maybe the Texas. And it goes from Florenzi. Rafael Nadal won his 19th Grand Slam title after holding off Russian Daniil Medvedev's exhilarating fight back in one of the greatest U.S. Open finals. Spain's Nadal 33 won 7 5-6-3, 5-7, 4-6, 6-4 against the fifth seed in New York. Nadal, seeded second, was cruising at two sets and a breakup only for Medvedev to force a decider. But Nadal stopped his momentum to clinch a 3 
revealing win in four hours and 50 minutes, just four minutes shorter than the longest U.S. Open final. Nadal's victory moves him within one of Swiss rival Roger Federer's all-time leading tally of men's Grand Slam victories. Change the rhythm of the of the match was just uh, incredible. So uh, well done to you, well done to to your great team that you have there, and all the very best for the future. I'm sure you will have many more chances to win here. So all the best. And that's the end of our bulletin tonight from our news editor, Nicholas Mongi, our news director, Dan Kilonzo, and Tracy Dorcas and myself, and indeed the time team here. Do enjoy the rest of your viewing. Keep it switched.